I need to establish some rules for this particular quest for truth. And uh, looking at my Facebook page and stuff, I guess got to say, you got to love cognitive dissonance. I mean, it's so easy to mock and ridicule. But finding tangible proof for one's belief, on the other hand, well, that's not so easy. So rather than mock, why not actually apply yourself to rational discussion in a genuine quest for truth? If you're open to such a dialogue, I'm going to have to set some rules here. What government on this planet is trustworthy? Can you name any? I can't. I can't think of any governments on this planet or plane or earth, whatever you want to call it. This thing we're standing on. I can't find any governments that are trustworthy. And the military of all of these governments, all of these countries, I mean, they take their marching orders from their government. Well, Let's go back to the first point. How many governments are trustworthy? Now, I understand that they're good men and women in the military, but they're taught to not question orders. You know, they do what they're told. And the government's telling them what to do. NASA was founded by Nazis and occultists. This is a fact. And most of the astronauts were Freemasons. And they've been caught in plenty of lies as an organization. All three whether we're talking about governments of the world, militaries of the world, or NASA, these people have, at least in, in the United States side of things anyway, they have access to trillions of unaccounted for dollars in, in state-of-the-art equipment of all sorts. Many of the members of these organizations at the highest levels are members of Luciferian secret societies serving the father of lies. Therefore, just imagine what kind of deception they are capable of and you'll understand why I won't trust any of them, and neither should you, as a source for any measure of truth about pretty much anything. When I make statements like occultists and Luciferians, okay, let me just say I'm not talking about Joe Blow at the lower level, employee level here, okay? They're, they're probably just as deceived as everybody else. And for the most part, these people are not paid to ask questions, but rather just to do what they're told. I'm talking about the ones that are calling the shots and pulling the strings. The ones who control what gets released to us, the public, and what does not get released to us. So let's, come on, let's just try to keep that in perspective, okay? I'm, I'm not painting a broad stroke over every single person in the government uh, or all the governments of the world or their military or NASA. I get that there are good people, they are good, honest, and sometimes even God-fearing people in these organizations. I just think, and I know from my own personal experiences, that the lower level folks generally have no clue as to what they're doing, what they're involved in, and how it could be enabling um, some things to come into fruition in the grand scheme of things. I mean, they have no idea what, what part they are playing, you know, as cogs in the wheel of some big picture, of some big piece of machinery. So with this in mind, if you're going to come to my Facebook page or comment on my YouTube videos and mock me or any of my friends because you're convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that we're on a spinning globe, I'm just going to ask you to please do your best to hold such condescending comments back. Okay, hold them back. I'm asking you to provide tangible evidence that and I don't need your opinion. Show us some tangible evidence that does not include references to any of what I've just mentioned, any of the above governments, military, or NASA. Take them out of the equation and then show us some tangible stuff. Okay, otherwise just move along. Shut this video off. Turn the radio station off. Get off my Facebook page. This discussion is not for you, all right? If, if your cognitive dissonance is, is such that you are incapable of considering something other than what you think you believe, then go away. This is, this is not for you. But if you're open for a quest for truth, then let's have the dialogue. Let's 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 look at both sides of the story. Look at look at things from every angle we can look at. You know, don't say, uh, "Well, I've done this my whole life, and I know this is the way it is." And you know, you never convince me because I've t I've said people to people, "Hey, look, I understand this is your profession. I understand that you 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 understand your job. You do it well. I get that. But is there another plausible way?" to arrive at the same conclusions that, sh that you say you believe in other than a globe. Because when I've done that, 
when I flipped the board and looked at the, the, all the arguments that I thought I had for the globe, I found I could poke holes in a lot of those arguments and find another plausible explanation apart from necessarily having to be on a globe to resolve those issues. So, you know, for those of you out there, you know, I get it. You, long range shooters. I understand you, you have to correct for Coriolis effect. That's a big one. One of a few things that's keeping me tied to the globe idea is I don't understand how the Coriolis effect would work on a, a flat earth. I don't get it. Um, so I, and I don't even understand how the whole thing works even on a globe. So for those of you out there who do understand those things, put your brain, flip the board, put your brain power to it and say, Hey, you know, is there another possible way that such an effect could still happen apart from being on a globe and see what happens? I mean, what's it going to hurt? You know, if you don't have time for it, fine, move on, but allow the rest of us to do the exercise. You know, I posted something on my Facebook page that says test all things, you know, because there's a coming great deception. So if all means all, you know, we might as well start exercising our, our brain muscles, as it were, you know, uh, in the I, in, in the exercise of, of testing now so that when something comes across our, our, our path in the future, we will have had the experience in knowing what it's like to test something that could be in a, a deception. If you if you don't, I mean, you only get good at what you practice. So why not start practicing now? You know, practicing this sort of thing now. I, that, that's all I'm saying. And you know, my buddy um, John, I, I have to say, he's the one that really kind of got me going on all this. We went out to eat one day, and it just sort of came up in the discussion because there's a lot of this stuff going on on Facebook. And he says, um, "You ever think about?" The curvature of the Earth as it pertains to water, I said I haven't really thought a whole but a whole lot about the curvature of the Earth at all. Never mind about water. He goes, well, you know, we're on a, a ball that's supposedly that's twenty five has a twenty five thousand mile circumference, which means that the curvature is about eight inches per mile. How does water curve? How do you get the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, and all these oceans to? Uh, curve eight inches per mile to maintain this alleged 25,000 mile circumference curvature of the earth. How does that happen? And, you know, of course, they, they throw out the magic pill. Gravity. Well, but, I mean, if gravity is causing the pull to maintain this uniform curvature, then that means that in the deeper areas of the ocean, the, cur the pull of gravity has to be stronger than it is in the shallow areas. Because if it's not strong enough, then it won't maintain the curve. And in the shallow areas, if it's if it maintains that same strength that's pulling the deepest part of the ocean down, then you won't get a nice uniform curve over the shallow areas. You get a dip. Because the, the pull of gravity would be pulling it down. You know, so how does that work? And you know, all of a sudden I'm doing, you know, the, the Flintstone sound effect there, you know, thinking uh, okay. I don't know. So I start looking into it, you know, and, and, and I'm going to put up something here. This is a, uh, website called the Atlantean conspiracy by a guy named Eric Dubay. Dubay. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name there. Uh, and he's got a, a, a section here dealing with water. I'm just going to go ahead and read it here. Eric says, it is part of the natural physics of water and other fluids to always find their level and remain flat. If disturbed in any way, motion ensues until the flat level is resumed. If dammed up, then released, the nature of all liquids is to quickly flood outwards, taking the easiest course towards finding its new level. The surface of all water when not agitated by natural causes, such as winds, tides, earthquakes, etc., is perfectly level. The sense of sight proves this to every unprejudiced and reasonable mind. Can any so-called scientist who teaches that the earth is a whirling globe take a heap of liquid water, whirl it around, and so make rotundity? He cannot. Therefore, it is utterly impossible to prove that an ocean is a whirling rotund section of a globular earth rushing through space 
at the lying given rate of false philosophers. That's from somebody named William Thomas Weisman in The Earth, an Irregular Plane. If we were living on a whirling ball earth, every pond, lake, marsh, canal, and other large body of standing water, each part would have to comprise a slight arc or semicircle curving, or probably curving downwards from the central summit. For example, if the ball Earth were 25,000 miles in circumference, as NASA and modern astronomers say, then spherical trigonometry dictates the surface of all standing water must curve downwards an easily measurable 8 inches per mile multiplied by the square of the distance. This means along a 6-mile channel of standing water, the Earth would dip 6 feet on either end from the central peak. To the benefit of true science, and to the detriment of modern astronomy's pseudoscience, such an experiment can and has been tested. In Cambridge, England, there is a 20-mile canal called the Old Bedford, which passes in a straight line through the Fenlands known as the Bedford Level. The water has no interruption from locks or water gates of any kind and remains stationary, making it perfectly suitable for determining whether any amount of convexity curvature actually exists. In the latter part of the 19th century, Dr. Samuel Robotham, a famous flat earther and author of the fine book, Earth Not a Globe, an experimental inquiry into the true figure of the Earth, proving it a plane without axial or orbital motion and the only material world in the universe, traveled to the Bedford level and performed a series of experiments to determine whether the surface of standing water is flat or convex. A boat with a flagstaff, the top of the flag five feet above the surface of the water, was directed to sail from a place called Welch's Dam, a well-known ferry passage, to another called Welney Bridge. These two points are six statute miles apart. The author, with a good telescope, went into the water and with the eye about eight inches above the surface, observed the receding boat during the whole period required to sail to Wenley Bridge. The flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the whole distance. There could be no mistake as to the distance passed over as the man in charge of the boat had instructions to lift one of his oars to the top of the arch the moment he reached the bridge. The experiment commenced about three o'clock in the afternoon of a summer's day, and the sun was shining brightly and nearly behind or against the boat during the whole of its passage. Nearly every condition had been fulfilled, and the result was to the last degree de definite and satisfactory. The conclusion was unavoidable that the surface of the water for a length of six miles did not in any appreciable extent decline or curvate downwards from the line of sight. But if the Earth is a globe, the surface of the six miles length of water would have been six feet higher in the center than at the two extremities. From this experiment, it follows that the surface of standing water is not convex, and therefore that the Earth is not a globe. On the contrary, this simple experiment is all sufficient to prove that the surface of the water is parallel to the line of sight and is therefore horizontal and that the Earth cannot be other than a plane. Dr. Samuel Robotham, Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, an experimental inquiry into the true figure of the Earth, proving a plane without axial or orbital motion and the only material world in the universe, 12 through 13. In a second experiment, Dr. Robotham placed seven flags along the edge of the water, each one mile distant from the next, with their tops positioned five feet above the surface. Near the last one, he also positioned a longer eight-foot staff bearing a three-foot flag so that its bottom aligned precisely with the tops of the other flags. He then mounted a telescope at a height of five feet behind the first flag and took his observations. If the Earth was a globe of 25,000 miles, each successive flag would have to decline a definite and determined amount below the last. The first and second flag simply establish the line of sight. The third flag should then fall eight inches below the second, the fourth flag 32 inches below, the fifth 
six feet, the sixth 10 feet, eight inches, and the seventh flag should be a clear 16 feet, eight inches below the line of sight. Even if the Earth was a globe of 100,000 miles, an amount of easily measurable curvature should and would still be evident in this experiment. But the reality is not a single inch of curvature was detected and the flags all lined up perfectly as consistent with a flat plane. This rotundity of the Earth would necessitate the above conditions, but as they cannot be found to exist, the doctrine must be pronounced as only a simple theory having no foundation in fact, a pure invention of misdirected genius. Splendid in its comprehensiveness and bearing upon natural phenomena, but nevertheless mathematical and logical necessities compel its denunciation as an absolute falsehood. Dr. Samuel Robotham in Z Zetatech Astronomy, Earth, Not a Globe, 14. Dr. Robotham conducted several other experiments using telescopes, spirit levels, and theodolites. I don't know what that is. Theodolites. Special precision instruments used for measuring angles in horizontal or vertical planes. By positioning them at equal heights aimed at each other successively, he proved over and over the earth to be perfectly flat for miles without a single inch of curvature. His findings caused quite a stir in the scientific community and thanks to 30 years of his efforts, the shape of the earth became a hot topic of debate around the turn of the 19th century. Is water level or is it not? Was a question once asked of an astronomer. Practically yes, theoretically no, was the reply. Now, when the theory does not harmonize with practice, the best thing to do is drop the theory. It is getting too late now to say so much the worse for the facts. To drop the theory, which supposes a curved surface to standing water, is to acknowledge the facts. Whenever experiments have been tried on the surface of standing water, the surface has always been found to be level. If the Earth were a globe, the surface of all standing water would be convex. This is an experimental proof that Earth is not a globe. William Carpenter, 100 proofs the Earth is not a globe. And, you know, I went out to the Malibu Beach in California and looked out over the beach and from left to right, you know, over a substantial distance. I mean, when you see the field of view that you're able to look at from one end of the, of, to the left, to the other, to the right, uh, it's a lot of ground right there, water right there, a lot of territory, a lot of mileage there. No curvature was detected. You know, if the Earth is a curve, I mean, it not only curves over the edge, you know, looking to the distance in front of you, but it's curving to the left and right, supposedly. But, you know, and to, to be fair, when there's land mass on the right and on the left, you know, forming sort of a um, boundary, to your, to your peripheral vision on the left and to the right and water in the middle, your brain does pull tricks on you. It does look like it is curved. You know, and I would have said, you know what? It looks curved to me. But when you put it in Photoshop and um, put some parallel lines over it, as I did, you end up, you know, like on the airplane, perfectly flat, um, on the beach, I mean, look at the distance. Look how far away those buildings are. There's some good mileage going on there. Flat as a pancake. Keep going, still flat. Keep going, flat. All the way to the right, flat. All the way across, flat, 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 flat. Everywhere I look, flat. So my personal test on the beach proved this, not this. You don't believe me? Go out there and do it yourself. See what happens. Post the results. Just don't use a fisheye lens or a wide angle, you know, a camera that's shooting wide angle because it's going to distort everything. And you know that you're using that type of lens if you move the camera up and down uh, while you're looking at the horizon and it goes from convex to flat to concave to flat to convex to flat to concave. You know, if it's it's if it's going back and forth and the ends are in the in the middle is is constantly morphing. Like in the Red Bull video, here you see it's it's morphing. You know, the Red Bull video is showing you that it solves the whole problem for us. We're not on a we're not on a globe. 
We're not on a, a convex surface. We're on a flat surface. We're on a concave surface. We're on all three. I mean, mystery solved. It's all it's all the above, because that's what you get when you use a fisheye lens and the camera starts moving in any way. So you can't you can't use that type of lens. The article here continues. Since any given body of water must have a level surface, no one part higher than another, and seeing that all our oceans, a few inland seas accepted are connected together, it follows that they are all virtually of the same level. The English Mechanic, 26th June. Uh, that's interesting. That's my birthday. June 26th, not 1896, but that date in 1896 my birthday. A little bit of serendipity there for me. Astronomers say the magical magnetism of gravity is what keeps all the oceans of the world stuck to the ball Earth. They say that because the Earth is so massive by virtue of this mass, it creates a magic force able to hold people, oceans, and atmosphere tightly clung to the underside of the spinning ball. Unfortunately, however, they cannot provide any practical example of this on a scale smaller than the planetary. For example, a spinning wet tennis ball has the exact opposite effect of the supposed ball Earth. Any water poured over it simply falls off the sides, and giving it a spin results in water flying off 360 degrees like a dog shaking after a bath. Astronomers concede the wet tennis ball example displays the opposite effect of their supposed ball Earth, but claim that at some unknown mass, the magic adhesive properties of gravity suddenly kick in, allowing the spinning wet tennis ball Earth to keep every drop of gravitized water stuck to the surface. Again, their theory flies in the face of all practical evidence, but they have been running with it for 500 years, so why stop now? If the Earth were a globe rolling and dashing through space at the rate of 100 miles in five seconds of time, the waters of seas and oceans could not, by any known law, be kept on its surface. The assertion that they could be retained under these circumstances being an outrage upon human understanding and credulity. But as the Earth, that is, the habitable world of dry land, is found to be standing out of the water and in the water of the mighty deep whose circumferential boundary is ice, we may throw the statement back into the teeth of those who make it and flaunt before their faces the flag of reason and common sense inscribed with a proof that the earth is not a globe. William Carpenter, 100 proofs the earth is not a globe. I guess page 86 it looks like. Okay, so this is, um, you know, it's an interesting article. It's what initially got m me thinking. And even considering the, the giving this any amount of my time, so you can check that out for yourself. Um, then, uh, of course, when I did one of my previous shows here, I think yeah, it was the last show. I showed this picture right here, talk uh, of this photograph taken by Joshua Nowicki, and somebody responded to my video. Oh, that looks totally fake. That's like Photoshop, you know. That's just you know, duh. That's totally fake. I said, okay, well, you know what? It was apparently believable enough for an ABC News affiliate to do this tap dance here um, in this video where the guy is like having to say, uh, well, you know, because that's 60 miles away and we know it's not possible to see something 60 miles away, then obviously what we're looking at here is a mirage. You know, that's what the, that's what the ABC Channel 57 News affiliate guy right here said. So, he believed it. ABC News believed it. They ran with it and did a tap, tap dance story to explain away why something that's 60 miles away, which should not be seen, was seen. It's a mirage. So they believed it was real. But if you just go look up this guy, um, you can find him uh, online. This is um, his pictures uh, that he's got on, on Facebook here. Um, trying to remember where I, um, trying to remember where I saw it. Maybe it's here, 2015. Yeah, there we go. Ah, yeah. So here's a video that the guy talk, the, 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 this guy took showing the Chicago skyline. Okay, over time, and this is, I guess, a time-lapse video. Uh, and as the sun starts to go down and the atmosphere gets less hazy things start to become more visible uh, 
Yeah. You know, I mean, I suppose you could say that's some really creative after effects if you wanted to. Um, you know, this guy's saying it's real. It's more believable than the stuff that I've been seeing uh, for the globe. People out there, in fact, I gotta, I, let me see if I can pull something out here on YouTube. Uh, I think it was called Earth Rotating. 24 hours for K, if I, if I remember right. Planet Earth in 4K. This animation shows the Earth from May 15th to May 19th, 2011. It was created from images produced by the geostationary Electro-L weather satellite. Now, this is supposedly real, authentic, anim you know, time-lapse of the Earth. Do you believe it? Do you believe this is actual time-lapse photography from a weather satellite looking down on our Earth? Me, personally? Uh, no. I don't believe it. I, um, I'm impressed by their ability to morph the clouds. That, that's a whole lot better than what the Galileo space probe did when it shot video of the Earth rotating in time-lapse. This one right here. No clouds moving. This is supposedly December 11th, 1990. The Galileo space probe supposedly shot this 25-hour time-lapse video. Look at that. None of these clouds are changing shape, morphing, or doing anything. 25 hours, complete rotation. Not one cloud dissipates. Not one cloud goes away. Not, not one cloud, you know... Uh, accumulates, shows up, nothing's moving, everything's following exactly the same right here. It looks like this is Australia. That cloud is going right over it. Perfect. 25 hours. Nothing's moving. You know, this is being passed off by Jet Propulsion Laboratories as legitimate. Well, you know, probably in the 1990s, that's about the best they could do with that type of animation. Now they've gotten a little bit better at it. But I'm not buying this as real because I can create a really believable Earth myself it looks very, very similar to this. Might even look better than this using a software that costs about $300 called View. In fact, I wonder if I can even show that. I don't even know if I have if I have View installed on this computer. I might actually be able to show you. Let me do a screen share on this. Screen share. Here's my Windows Explorer. I'm looking at that folder. Okay, that's an Earth I created back uh, on August 28th, 2006. Okay, using the software right here, View. I, I use some of the bitmaps that you can get online. You can get some of these various things. You know, how did they get these clouds? You know, this, this is a really nice bitmap of just clouds, no Earth. Did somebody actually get in there and erase the Earth underneath all those clouds? Or did somebody just make all these clouds up? Uh, it seems more likely, especially when you consider some of these cloud formations seem to always show up. They look the same on every Earth I've ever seen. Same exact cloud formations. In fact, um, you can take those clouds and map them on top of some of these other files like this. You can get these files online you know, and, and shade them different ways, different atmospheres. Um, you can create masks for them like that. Uh, you, you can put, uh, when you create a mask like this and you, you mess around with the 3D software to give it this nighttime look, these are the city lights you can map on there. So I can make an earth that ha looks like it's, you know, an earth at night, or I can make an earth that looks like it's at day. Put that same silly swirly cloud formation that you've seen like in every other image of it and make this earth i made this me rob skiba 828 2006 okay i made that compare that to this and frankly i'm not impressed planet earth in 4k
this is being passed off as a legitimate time-lapse video from a geosynchronous satellite, supposedly. You read the um, description here, November 15, 2014. A time-lapse of Earth in 4K resolution as imaged by the geostationary Electro-L weather satellite from May 15 to May 19, 2011. Electro-L is located 40,000 kilometers above the Indian Ocean, and it's and it orbits at a speed that causes it to remain over the same spot as the Earth rotates. The satellite creates a 121 megapixel image every 30 minutes with visible and infrared light wavelengths. The images were edited to adjust levels and change the infrared channel from orange to green to show vegetation more naturally. The images were resized by 50%. Misalignment between frames were manually corrected and image artifacts that occurred when the camera was facing toward the sun were partially corrected. The images were interpolated by a factor of 20 to create a smooth animation. The animation was rendered in the YouTube 4K UHD resolution 2840 by 2160. An original animation file with a resolution of 55 uh, 68 by 5568 is available on request. To answer frequently asked questions, why are city lights, the sun, and other stars not visible? City lights are not visible because they are thousands of times less bright than the reflection of sunlight off the Earth. If the camera was sensitive enough to detect city lights, the Earth would be overexposed. The sun is not visible due to mechanisms used to protect the camera CCD from direct exposure to sunlight. A circular mask on the CCD ens ensures that only the Earth is visible. This mask can be seen as pixelation on Earth's horizon. The mask also excludes stars from view, although they would not be bright enough to be visible to this camera. Sounds good. Sounds reasonable. I could maybe buy that if I wasn't a 3D animator myself um, and think this is a load of crap. Because when I made that globe back in 2006, this is how I used it in some of the ministry videos I created while I was a missionary. Now as we began to take a step back and look at the mission that God has called us to, we found it necessary to set some 10-year goals. We call those 10-year goals the 1% factor. It's our desire to be able to train 10,000 church planning leaders to establish 1,000 grace-oriented churches. To penetrate 100 unreached people groups. Exposing 50 million people to the gospel by the year 2012. Then I did this video the following year, 2007. I'm going to show you a bunch of clips from that video. In fact, I even won a Tele Award for these animations. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. We've got to get that message out. Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. Time is of the essence. More than five billion people still need to hear the gospel. We've got a job to do. Tell people about Jesus Christ. You know, Hudson Taylor once said, why should one person hear the gospel twice when there are tens of millions of people who've never even heard the name of Jesus once? So right now, one of our strategic objectives is to go into these restricted access countries and expose 50 million people to the gospel. The 50 million comes from the 1% factor, which is our 10-year strategy to reach 1% of the unbelieving world. The goal is to expose 50 million people to the gospel, to train 10,000 national leaders, plant 1,000 grace-oriented churches and penetrate 100 unreached people groups all by the year 2012. You plant a seed with the gospel and you can reach a village. If you reach a village, you can reach a mountainside. If you reach a mountainside, you can reach a district. If you reach a district, you can reach a state. If you reach a state, you can reach a country. If you reach a country, you can reach a continent. And that's why we come. We can reach the world for Jesus Christ. We can, but we're going to have to work together to do it. And so I think that a question that is before our generation is really simple. Do I retreat or do I engage? And I guarantee you, if you and I choose to engage, Jesus Christ will meet us personally and lead you and I on an adventure that none of us could ever imagine.
I created that globe back in 2006, and uh, I used it over and over and over again. I'm, I can't even tell you how many times I used that globe, both for my own missionary journeys as well as for the videos that I was creating for the uh, ministry and to help them illustrate their 10-year plan. They had a plan from 2002 to 2012 to reach the world. So naturally, I was depicting the world as a globe in various ways. Then in 2008, the Japanese put this video out, allegedly from one of their uh, lunar probes, showing the Earth rising over the moon's surface. The Kaguya moves toward the South Pole on the far side of the moon. The blue Earth has appeared from the horizon. This is the Earth rise as captured by the telephoto camera. The sun is located right behind the Kaguya. The sun's light is projected directly onto the Earth, which appears round like a full moon. In this footage, the Earth's southern hemisphere appears on top. This is a spectacular view of the beautiful planet we call home. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but it looks more like a spectacular view of a high school level flash animation project. Maybe I'm prejudiced, but let's compare what I did with this so-called official space footage. You tell me what you think. Which one looks more realistic to you? Now, granted, I'm biased, right? I made it. But I think if I had nothing to do with this and somebody put these two up side by side, eh, I'd probably be more inclined to pick the video on the left, especially if it was slowed down. I mean, it, it was meant to be as fast as it was to fit the pacing of the video that I was making. But if I took the time to render that out a lot slower in the same way the Japanese one did, uh, I don't know, the shading, the shadows, and everything else, uh, to me, I think are a lot more believable than the one that I did. And I'm not just saying that because I did it. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But then you post a picture like the Chicago skyline and everybody's like, well, that let's just look like Photoshop. They don't question the crap coming out of NASA where they can't even get scale or color right. And they're always using the same cloud covers. I mean, look how big the United States of America is on this globe compared to this globe. And both of these are official NASA photographs. Now, I had some guy on YouTube go off of me because I posted this saying what I'm saying now. And he's like, oh, just because some flat earther can put together some composite images like that, that doesn't prove anything. I'm like, uh, no, do like five minutes of research, buddy, before you make comments like that, showing just how ignorant you are by condemning without investigating. These are actual NASA photographs, which I put right here on my blog, quoting from them. You can click on the space.com website, space.com, go to their own photo gallery, click on it, the picture number four, and see the pictures for yourself. If you took a minute to actually investigate before condemning the NASA website, same thing, you know, the, the, the other picture right here, taken April 22nd, 2014 on Earth Day, you know, NASA website, click on their website, go to their own pictures, look through them, pick their pictures, look through it, you know, because that's what I did, you know. Take a minute to do some research before you go out there condemning people who actually do the research, right? NASA, this is not some flat earther, you know, putting this stuff together to try to discredit NASA. They do a good job of discrediting themselves, they don't need flat earthers help. So if you're going to question, you know, some guy who's just out there, you know, taking nice pictures, you know, he's out there taking pictures. Here's another video that he took. Time lapse looking toward Chicago from the top of a dune in Warren Dunes State Park, April 29, 2015. So just, you know, a couple of weeks ago. The last few seconds are the most interesting part. Be sure to click on the HD button. Uh, I don't see an HD button, so. So, you know, the atmosphere is changing here. This is a time-lapse photo. 60 miles away. You're not supposed to be able to see this. Look at that. 
city of Chicago from 60 miles away. And yet some knucklehead drone is going to read a prompter that's telling him to explain this as a mirage. These are photographs taken by a guy named Joshua Nowicki, right? Right on his website. Um, here are some more of his pictures. You can check out for yourself, you know, look at them. Chicago, that doesn't look like a mirage to me. The buildings also are not leaning off to the sides or leaning away from you. They are perfectly straight up and down. You know, if, if this is a mirage, I mean, first of all, it would be all distorted and wavy and look totally weird. If we really are on a globe, then they should be, like, facing away from you, <coughs> leaning away, not perfect straight up and down. They should be leaning side to side. They shouldn't look like that. You know, based on my own tests that, that I've been doing, I believe this guy. I think that that's really Chicago. I got a friend of mine, Rick Hummer. He says, you know, he's seen it too. He's looked out over the, you know, the horizon there and seen Chicago from where he lives in this general area. He said, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to wait for a nice clear day. I'm going to set the camera up so I can see it, you know, from this distance. And I'm just going to take a boat right across and just drive it all the way there and, and watch, you know, the city get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. Not all of a sudden, magically, the mirage goes away and then the city pops up over the horizon. Do the test for yourself, people. That's all I'm saying here. You know, you need to start questioning stuff. Why is it that we have these uh, experiments down in Antarctica in the late 1950s? They go down there, Operation Deep Freeze and stuff. And then after this last expedition, everybody, you know, all pulls out and they sign the Atlantic Treaty saying that, you know, the Antarctica Treaty saying you can't set up any military bases down there. I understand that. That makes sense. But you also can't go down there and do whatever you want to do. You have to get permission. And even then, you're going to go there under heavy restrictions. You can't do whatever you want down there. You know, everybody everybody pulled out and signed this treaty after that expedition. And, and right around that same time or shortly after that, you've got them, the, the government, doing Operation Fishbowl. Operation Fishbowl. Why do they call it Operation Fishbowl? This is where they do, uh, I think it was five nuclear tests where they were doing high-altitude explosions. Uh, bluegill, starfish, starfish prime. And, um, I mean, you watch some of those videos. You know, here's a nuclear, this is a uh, video, nuclear weapons test, Operation Dominic, of which, I, uh, as I understand it, um, Operation Fishbowl was part of, it's a, as part of the larger Operation Dominic. So, you know, the flat earthers believe that we're in a dome. And a fishbowl would be basically, you know, a dome. <laughs> if it was turned upside down, it would, right? Turn a fishbowl upside down, what do you get? You get a dome, right? Above Johnston Island. Most of these bombs were carried aloft by the Air Force's Thor missile to continue the research of neutralizing incoming enemy warheads high above the Earth. Nuclear weapon testing had joined the space age. Okay, so it shows a bunch of bombs going off, or, or missiles going off, then they explode. High altitude nuclear explosions shortly after locking down Antarctica. I mean, <laughs> if I were to take the flat earther's point of view, it, this makes an interesting case for them trying to test the dome. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, I don't know. I mean, I know what they say, but if if we are in fact in an enclosed system with a metal dome, as Scripture tells us that it, we are, then it kind of looks like these guys are launching missiles up into the dome. Maybe it's all a coincidence, you know? Maybe, could be. 
But I mean, if they're trying to, you know, get us to not believe in conspiracy, I mean, look at just the names at some of these things. The Antarctic Expedition, right? British Antarctic Expedition, 1907 to 1909. Well, in 1908, Nimrod was born. 1908 years after creation, Nimrod was born. What's the expedition called? The Nimrod Expedition on a ship called the Nimrod. What was his desire? What, what, Nimrod's desire in, in the Bible? To reach into heaven. I don't know. You know, just these are the crazy little things that keep me kind of looking at this whole thing and scratching my head going... I don't know. I, I'm, I've just got to keep hopping down this bunny trail until I figure out what the deal is. It's why I'm even entertaining the idea of looking deeper. And even though there are plenty of people out there bashing and mocking and scoffing and ridiculing and stuff like that, I have to say, I've been running into actually a shocking number of people who are either doing the same thing that I'm doing here, you know, looking into this stuff or, or, you know, some of them are even standing firm. You know, they firmly believe we are on a flat earth here in the 21st century. I mean, it's true. So, I mean, at this point you have a choice. I mean, either you can write all these people off as completely insane and crazy and ridiculous, which many of you are doing. Um, or you can take a step back and say, why are otherwise intelligent people, even considering this stuff. I mean, it's real easy to just write everybody off. But I'll tell you, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there are some very interesting people, educated people at that, who have been contacting me on the side. You know, they don't want to go public like I'm going. They're probably smart, you know, not coming out like I've been coming out. But they would say, hey, you know, you know, don't say anything to anybody else. But, you know, I've been looking at this too. And I, I you know, I got to say, and, you know, they're, they're giving me their opinions on it. And um, I've been having quite a number of people contacting me by email and by phone and stuff like that. And people saying, Hey, keep digging, man. You know, you're on the right track. Don't give up, you know, uh, consider this, you know, like people who've already been looking in some cases for a long time now, just haven't told anybody about it. But when I came out talking about it, like I am, you know, they're all of a sudden saying, Hey, here's somebody I can share my stuff with. And you know, quite a number of people have been doing it. Um, then a couple of days ago, I was uh, having an interesting dialogue with my friend John. Again, he's the guy uh, who I mentioned earlier who really got me thinking about all this stuff with the, you know, how does water curve? You know, uh, We had a really cool uh, Skype conversation for about two hours, and uh, uh, he didn't mind that I recorded it. I asked him, can I, re can I record us talking? I, mean, I want to I keep some of this stuff. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So uh, I'm going to play a few clips from that conversation. I think you'll find it interesting, uh, especially concerning the part where John's talking about GPS. Uh, I think you'll find this rather intriguing. All right, here we go. So uh, on Facebook, I don't know, a week or two ago, you sent me something about a conversation you had with somebody concerning GPS, and I wanted to hear that story again. So you were saying somebody had some kind of deal that uh, they had worked in the Air Force or something? Yeah, actually... Uh we have a you know Bible study that meets here every Friday night at our house, and uh, one of the couples that comes, their son uh, is still in the Air Force. He's an E7, uh, 15 years, and he specializes in uh, ground-based radar as well as GPS. And I didn't tell him why I was really asking him a lot of questions, but he'd come to the when he's home on leave, he'll come to Bible study. And I know he just got stationed from – restationed from Germany over to uh, out in Arizona, and he was here this past week, and we started talking. And I said, hey, you know, you've come from time to time over the last couple of years. And, you know, I was just curious what you do in the Air Force, and he told me ground-based radar is where he started and that he uh, now works with GPS and – and um, air traffic control and things and controlling aircraft. And I said, really, I said, uh, I've always wondered, I've heard rumors that GPS is a fully ground-based system. Um, is that true or not? And he said, well, yes, it's a ground-based system that fully operates on towers. And then he goes, we uh, send signals that bounce off of uh, different airplanes, AWACS and other type of aircraft. And then it, they used that for triangulation, and, and that's how the GPS system works for the military, specifically what he does in the Air Force, which I found very interesting because I had an interview with Eric Dubai, uh, and he was talking about that uh, GPS systems are all 
ground-based technology that you don't need the use of satellites like what we've been told. And here I have an E7 in the Air Force, 15 years, who's confirming something that Eric Dubai said, you know, uh, and, you know, he had no agenda. He didn't even really know why I was asking him. Uh, and I didn't go into a bunch of deal, details on the flat earth. So I just thought it was very interesting. That's why I want to share it with you. Yeah, that's so crazy because uh, Sheila and I had just got back from California last Monday and we were out there for a uh, little over a week. And when we first got there, we flew into San Diego and we went on the USS Midway. And, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking, I mean, I've been thinking about flat earth, you know, all along, but I just went to go on a tour of the ship. You know, I had no flat earth agenda. I was just going to go on a little tour. And mm -hmm. as I'm going through the tour, I didn't get very far into it when I see the azimuthal equidistant map uh, on a plaque dedicated to the USS Midway. I'm going, oh, okay, well, all right. So that's interesting. And then we go up to the uh, control room and, and the navigation room and the, the bridge and all that. And, and the tour guide is talking <laughs> at each of these places. And he just kind of out of nowhere says, You got a couple of GPSs back on the bench here. The back one is 80s technology. The front one is 90s technology. GPS was developed by the Navy for submarine service. And went on from there. Now we have it's everywhere. And I didn't know this till the other day that we have the United States, we control all the GPS satellites. They're all ours. And we let the rest of the world, everybody gets to use them for free. Because we're such nice guys. That ain't right. Uh, that ain't right. <laughs> Well, isn't that convenient because, you know, everybody wants to talk about GPS and, as proof of a globe and, you know, global positional satellites and all of that stuff. And they always say that, you know, there's satellites up there. Well, we're the ones in charge of it all. We're the ones that call the shots. We're the ones that let people see whatever we want them to see, apparently, according to that deal. So this guy, E7 in the Air Force, is saying it's all ground-based and it's bouncing off of AWACS and other... Uh, types of aircraft. That's exactly what he said. Um, what was funny during that conversation, I was curious about satellites um, because I used to live out in California and Vandenberg Air Force Base isn't too far from Los Angeles at the northern coast or up the uh, coast there towards northern California. And they launched a lot of missiles and the Air Force used to put out press releases and stuff of the launches from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And they said they were putting up satellites and military spy satellites and things like that. So I asked him, I said, hey, just out of curiosity, you know, what can you tell me about the satellites that we have up in space uh, that are in orbit and things like that? And he just kind of smiled and looked at me and I was like, well, can you tell me anything about him? He goes, well, I can't, you know, it's, it's classified. Uh, but I found it interesting that he wasn't willing to talk about satellites at all um, and really dodged the questions. And yet he had a look on his face and what I do for a living, I'm good at reading people. And he just had this look on his face like, you know, man, I want to, I want to talk, but I just can't, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. <laughs> You know, this whole thing, you know, I, I, first of all, if the flat earther model is true, then the way that they have it depicted, the, the sun and moon are floating up there somehow. So they, they are, there apparently is a vacuum of some sort within which stuff is able to orbit. So I don't have any problem. I mean, some of the flat earthers say there's no satellites at all. I, I, you know, if the sun and moon are orbiting within the canopy, uh, within the, the dome, uh, in that model, then I don't have any problem believing that the ISS could be up there or that the that there could be satellites up there. Uh, although, I mean, the more you look into it, the more you start questioning this stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, like the ISS stuff, some of that stuff just looks so blatantly false. In fact, there's all these videos showing what appears to be bubbles, you know, like as if it's being shot underwater, you know. So I don't, I don't, I really, honestly, I don't know what to, what to think about some of that stuff. I don't either. I mean, the thing is, is that I really do think something is up there. Um, I believe that we're putting technology up there. I just believe it's not what we've been told that it is. Um, obviously, they're launching missiles from Vandenberg Air Force Base with some kind of a payload going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we launched Apollo rockets going somewhere. We launched space shuttles going somewhere. So obviously, there's something there. And obviously, the military is not going to talk. But what I found interesting was is that the GPS – uh, is a ground-based system bouncing off of uh, military aircraft uh, that are constantly in the air. And that's what, that's what this guy's job is. He basically maintains the system and maintains contact with the pilots that fly the different planes 
the AWACS and other other airline uh, other aircraft that are up in the uh, skies over the United States and other parts of the world. And wherever he's stationed, they have other men like him that do that all around the world. So you know, yes, it's a, a very advanced system, but it, it's uh, it's it from what he's saying, it's ground based. And we talked a little bit about HARP, and you know, that's all tied into it somehow as well. So, it, I, like I said, I just believe that what we're told by governments is not the truth. I got to say this whole investigation is really frustrating to me and to make matters worse. Um, you know, I think, you know, I've got this kind of nervous thing. This, uh, my, my nerves are kind of weird. Yes. And, and, uh, it, it, unfortunately it prevents me from being able to hold a camera steady. Like I used to be able to, I went to a, uh, reservoir near my house a couple days ago. I got a cheap telescope. Uh, it was like 30 bucks at uh, Academy Sports. I think it was like a 100 or 150 power telescope, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the reservoir and the math says I shouldn't be able to see, you know, the, the other, the, the, the shoreline on the other side. Um, yes. But I already knew that I would be able to. I just wanted to try to document it. So I went out there with the telescope, looked through it. I could see stuff that it, theoretically I shouldn't be able to see on the other side. But when I was trying to get the camera into the eyepiece to take a picture of it, my skin hands were like, I couldn't because you're looking through such a small hole yeah. you know, that's already shaking on a cheesy tri tripod to begin with. <laughs> w w when, between that and, and the, my shaky, nervous problem, I was, I was so frustrated because I, I couldn't get the picture that I wanted to get, you know? So I'm like, uh, so I, I'm, I'm frustrated by what my own physical limitations and, and optics and stuff like that right now. But I'm, I'm, it's like, okay, I could go out with a pair of binoculars and a pair of teles you know, a telescope or something and look across the distance and see things I'm not supposed to see, but then everybody's just going to have to believe me, you know? Right. And so I, I'm like determined to try to find a way to, to where I can document it. And, and even if I do that, I'm telling people, look, don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you what I did. You can take it or leave it. Yeah. It, believe me or don't believe me. I frankly don't care, but I'm going to try to document it as best as I can. And then you should go out and repeat the test for yourself. You know, that's one, but I, I'm, I'm just saying, man, it, it's getting frustrating because some of the tests I want to do were at uh, eight to 12 miles in distance. And, you know, a camera zoom is okay for that, but it's, it's not ideal. So you really kind of need to help with that. And, uh, you know, just the frustration of mating a camera to uh, a binoc telescope. binoculars or a telescope. I don't, I don't have the equipment and I don't have the desire to spend the kind of money that some of that stuff costs to uh, do it. So I don't know. I, I, I'm frustrated by it, but at the same time, I, I'm putting the call out for everybody who who's watching or reading any of the stuff I'm putting out and say, Hey, look, Go out there and do this stuff for yourself and then post the results for me because I want to see it too. 